Okay, guys. Um, so, uh, sorry for missing class this morning. This is the recorded lecture for this morning, and I wanted to remind you also that there is an exam uh, on Saturday, or that opens on Saturday for 24 hours. So from Saturday at 3 to Sunday at 3. Um, it's on weeks 1, 2, and 3 of our content. If you have any questions about anything, you've got to call me. You've got to use my cell phone, text me, call me, whatever, um, especially if you have any uh, questions about this chapter. Um, but please listen to this whole recording um, and then um, and then do well on your exam, okay? Uh, so here are your learning outcomes. I'm not going to um, uh, explain these any further. Uh, we'll just go through this lecture um, as quickly as possible. I know it's hard to listen to drone on on uh, recording. So anyways, um, just a couple of things I wanted to point out about spontaneous abortions. Spontaneous abor abortions are miscarriages, but in the medical world we call them um, spontaneous abortions, and that could be very offensive to parents. Very hurtful and offensive. So just I just wanted to point out to you to be careful when using this terminology to always use miscarriage uh, with patients who've had spontaneous abortions or spontaneous miscarriages. Um, this is different, although it's classified the same. Abortion is an abortion is an abortion. So if it's an elective abortion or a spontaneous abortion, it's it's grouped in the same category and counted the same. So um, please be sure to use miscarriage with your patient. So a baby who is born before 20 weeks gestation is called an aborted baby, whether it's spontaneous or elective. If it's before 20 weeks, it's an abortion. Um, and there's early losses and there's late losses. Early losses are before 20 weeks and of course late losses are after. Um, the later the abortion, the more developed the baby is. So it can be uh, pretty traumatic um, to, to see if, they're, if they end up seeing the baby um, after it's born. But here are your reasons why uh, women have could, ha could have abortions. Of course, any abnormalities in the baby that are incompatible with life um, that could cause an abortion, of course. Not all, but um, not all chromosomal abnormalities are aborted, okay? Um, but, but this can cause abortions. Um, infections, uh, mom having severe infections can cause abortions. Um, any um, type of maternal anatomical problem as well. So what are the signs and symptoms of abortion? Bleeding, cramping, abdominal pain, um, or decreased symptoms of pregnancy. So that's, that's kind of vague and kind of hard to even determine. And then, so we get a lot of calls, women who are eight weeks, 16 weeks, I'm bleeding, I'm cramping, um, what should I do? We have them come in. We hydrate them, we give them pain medicine if needed, you know, we, mo we watch the amount of blood she's bleeding, um, we give her psychological support, emotional support, but there's nothing we can do to stop her from aborting her fetus. Um, so, it's, I mean, if it's before 20 weeks, so, you know, basically we're just supporting the woman. Plus, we want to make sure that all the contents of the pregnancy have been birthed because if she retains any uh, contents of the pregnancy uh, that would cause her to bleed. So those are her signs and symptoms. We would do, do a diagnostic um, ultrasound. Um, I mean we would diagnose it um, with her signs and symptoms with the ultrasound, a blood test that shows um, HCG but lower levels than what you would anticipate with a healthy um, pregnancy. We'd look at her H and H, of course. Uh, we would do an ABO and RH, and we will talk an indirect Coombs, and we'll talk about uh, why about the RH being important. So management again is you know we might hydrate her, we might give her pain medicine, support, and observation and monitoring of her blood loss. We may end up doing a DNC, um, a dilation and curatage of her of um, 
um, of her uterine contents, dilation of her cervix, and it's basically scraping out the uterine contents. Um, you know, if she's having trouble aborting the fetus or only um, having um, incomplete abortion or incomplete uh, retaining, sorry, retaining contents of pregnancy. Um, and then um, for a woman who's RH negative and non-sensitized, we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, we will give her a Rogam injection. All right, cervical insufficiency, or you'll hear it called cervical incompetence. That's where um, she has dilation, painless dilation of the cervix. Um, there's no bleeding. There's no contraction. There's no infection. She, her cervix is just dilating, like, and she doesn't even know it. So she could be in her first trimester. She could be in her second trimester. Um, but anyways, we dilate this one um by transvaginal ultrasound so um we do a, a vaginal ultrasound um we look at her cervix we look at the cervical length um and we diagnose based on if her cervix is shortening and if she's starting to dilate or if what we called funneling so what funneling is is it's the shortening of the cervical segment the inner os is dilating and the um, outer os is not yet dilating. Um, or also if she had a history of a second trimester loss, uh, that might indicate a cervical um, incompetence of some sort. So what do we do for that? Well, we place the cerclage. The earlier we place the cerclage, the, um, the better um, success we have on keeping her pregnant to term. Um, but we remove that cerclage at 37 weeks and she either starts dilating and going into labor or she stays pregnant for a couple of weeks and then goes into labor. Um, but we give her tocolytics. Tocolytics are medications to keep her from contracting because we did just stitch um, that cerclage. If you recall from the text, the cerclage is stitching the cervix closed so it can't dilate. Um, so we So that could cause her to start contracting so we give her tocolytics we manage her pain we watch her for 24 hours to make sure she's not having any bleeding or um, signs of infection or um, signs of labor and then we can let her go home after that point hyperemesis gravidarum is an exaggerated um, prolonged um, nausea and vomiting during pregnancy it's not the typical morning sickness. It's morning sickness on steroids, where this person can't even breathe air without getting nauseated. Um, they definitely can't eat or keep fluids down, and this may last the entire pregnancy. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's different than morning sickness. Um, these people are, are basically, um, they can't eat or drink anything for days and days and days and possibly weeks. So anyways, you know how unhealthy that could be for anybody, let alone someone who is pregnant and the pregnancy. So um, how we manage these people is, of course, rest, um, small, frequent, bland meals, high protein meals or snacks. And if it's bad enough, like if they can't even eat small, frequent meals, um, they can't eat anything, they can't keep anything down, they can't keep water down then they're going to be hospitalized. Of course, we're going to have them on IV fluids. Um, we're going to have them eating nothing because they can't keep it down, but we're going to put them on TPN. Okay, so she's going to have to have some sort of long-term, may have to have a long-term um, IV placement. So like a PICC line. Um, and then she might have some sort of anti-emetic cocktail to help with her nausea and vomiting. Now, we hospitalize these people, but usually, um, in a large majority of the cases, these people are discharged with their, with, their, with their PICC line in place, and they're on TPN at home, where the home health nurse has to come and give them their TPN, because this is the only way they can take nutrition, because this hyperemesis gravidarum is no joke. Um, and we've had women on TPN for their entire pregnancy. So um, it's really, um, and then of course it, you know, it puts that pregnancy at risk. Um, it puts the baby at risk for intrauterine growth restriction. 
um, and, um, you know, harms the woman's health. I mean, basically starvation. Um, is, oh, I thought I got all these cleared up. Um, sorry, I hate these. Um, all right, placenta previa. Um, know this one because this is very common in our practice. You'll hear a lot about it. So it's usually diagnosed um, with a second semester ultrasound. Um, the signs and symptoms of placenta previa are painless vaginal bleeding. Um, if you do a Leopold's maneuver, then um, a lot of times the baby is breech or, or, or in an oblique transverse type position. Um, we don't want to do any vaginal exams with this. Now, I guess I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Do you remember reading and, and recording in your study guide what a placenta previa is? That it is a placenta that is covering the cervical os, or at least um, dangerously close to the cervical os. And so whatever part of the placenta is covering the cervix, that placenta is opened to a non-closed circuit vascular system. The placenta that's embedded into the uterus is a closed circuit vascular system. Well, if this if it's not embedded in the uterus, that portion of the cervix or that portion of the placenta is no longer composed of a closed circuit circulatory system. It's open circuit, which means she bleeds. Um, and that's where the painless vaginal bleeding is. Leopold's maneuver with the breech and oblique transverse babies is because that placenta is sitting in the bottom of the uterus where the baby usually hangs out. So they're not able to turn and get in the right position to descend in the pelvis. So that's why we see them typically in the breech position. We don't want to do vag exams because we don't want to poke the bear. We don't want to poke that placenta and cause it to bleed more. We would see um, if mom was having a severe bleeding episode, we would start seeing late decelerations in our baby's heart rate tracing. And if the bleed was significant enough, we could see a bradycardia in our babe, um, absent variability because baby isn't getting um, oxygen. Um, and then the baby will, if this continues, will die. Okay. So what we do for this is we put these people on bed rest because we don't want any physical stimulation on the placenta. Um, of course, we stabilize mom and babe. Um, she's on a continuous fetal monitoring and probably on IV fluids. Now, this is if um, if she's not in labor um, and she's bleeding. If she has a placenta previa that is not bleeding and she is not in labor, we don't need to do anything, right? Don't fix it if it's not broke. Um, but this is if she's having bleeding issues that are significant enough to be hospitalized. Um, depending on the position of the placenta, uh, we may need to deliver this person. Um, and whether she is able to have a vaginal, vaginal delivery will be determined by where that placenta is positioned. Now, um, so we're going to do the labs. These are just basically standard labs for anybody with a bleeding problem who's pregnant. CBC, PT, and PTT, um, fibrin um, split products, fibrinogen, and Clyhauer Becky test. Clyhauer Becky test detects fetal blood cells and maternal circulation. Okay, um, we need to do an RH. Uh, um, uh, if mom is RH negative, um, we need to. We need to test to see if she's um, sensitized or not. Um, that's with the indirect Coombs test. And if she's not sensitized, we can give her the Rogam. I will talk about this more in a moment. Um, depending on how many weeks she is, um, we will give her betamethasone. Betamethasone is an IM injection given two doses, 24 hours apart. This steroid is used to help baby um, beef up their surfactant production and lung maturity. Okay, so this baby may be born early, so we want to try to get those lungs as mature as possible. Um, and then depending on the woman's state, her bleeding, um, the state of the fetal heart rate monitoring, do we need to deliver this woman? Can she be delivered vaginally or by cesarean section? So what will tell us? Well, a complete previa is when the placenta is 
completely covering the cervical os. There is no, absolutely no way this can be delivered vaginally. The woman and baby would bleed to death. You can see here, this portion of the placenta is, is not in a closed circuit uh, circulation. Um, so it's just bleeding right out into her vagina. And as she dilates, she's going to expose more uh, borders of the placenta. So she'll probably bleed more. So this is a cesarean section, and it is a, an emergent cesarean section. Okay. A partial previa also cannot be delivered vaginally. The, uh, a portion of uh, the placenta is covering a portion of the cervix, um, and that portion is bleeding. Now, as the cervix dilates, it will expose more placenta and more bleeding. So this cannot be delivered vaginally. It needs to be delivered by cesarean section. This is a marginal previa uh, cesarean section delivery for the same reason as the partial. Um, even though there's only a little bit of placenta here over the cervix, as she dilates in labor, she'll be exposing more placenta, therefore bleeding more. So this one needs to also be a cesarean section. Oh, I don't have low-lying placenta. So low-lying placenta is the placenta, let's say the placenta is here, low in the uterus, close to the cervix. Baby was able to come and position head down. We assume um, as she dilates to complete, it will not expose any placenta, and therefore a low-lying placenta can probably deliver vaginally. All right, so remember placenta previa and the care of that, okay? Um, an abrupto placenta is a placenta that has broken away from the uterus prematurely. In other words, sometimes this occurs and the woman's not even in labor and she's only 32 weeks and the placenta starts breaking away from the uterus. When that happens, what do we have? We no longer have a closed circuit vascular system. Okay, so she's bleeding out into the uterus, very similar to um, placenta previa. So she has third trimester bleeding that is associated with severe abdominal pain, uterine tenderness on palpation. Her uterus will feel um, board-like, like a board-like abdomen, like hard as a rock all the time. She may have back pain. You may not see bleeding or you may see bleeding. Um, she will have an abnormal contraction pattern, which is um, the contraction pattern actually looks like She's having a contraction every 20 seconds, and the contractions only last 20 to 30 seconds. Um, it's because that uterus is almost in a, a con continual contracted state. We will see fetal heart rate uh, late decelerations. Um, bradycardia will, um, will advance to bradycardia, and then um, absent variability, and then fetal demise. Okay. Um, this is diagnosed by ultrasound, however, ultrasound, or by clinical findings and ultrasound, um, however, ultrasound is not always reliable. In other words, they don't always see the bleed. Um, management is depending on severity. And if bleeding stops, it is possible for that to clot off. And if that clots off and baby is still getting enough nutrients from the part of the placenta that is not abrupted, and baby's heart rate looks good, we can continue that pregnancy. But if baby's heart rates look bad, even if the bleeding stops, then we probably need to deliver that patient. Now, um, we were, we're going to admit that patient. She's going to have IVs, just like IV fluids, just like the previous patient. Um, she's going to be on fetal monitoring. Um, we're going to get a CB, C, PTT, PT, PT, PTT, the fibrinogen and the fibrinogen, clyharabeki to de detect fetal blood cells. If mom is Rh negative and not sensitized, we're going to give her Rogam. We're going to give betamethasone if she's preterm for baby's lung maturity. And then we need to decide: is she does she need delivered? Can she be delivered by uh, can she have a vaginal delivery, or does she need delivered by a cesarean section? Now here is some um, photos of. Um, placenta previa, uh, abruption, sorry. So here's the placenta. It's adhered to the uterus, except for this little place right here. And we're, it, this is showing you in a cross-sectional view. So um, 
the whole placenta is adhered except the very center of the placenta is not adhered. All the edges are adhered, but in the center of the uterus it is not adhered. Um, and she is bleeding from there. And you will not see bleeding out the vagina because it's concealed within the um, adhered borders of the placenta. So hopefully what happens is she bleeds a little bit, that blood creates dries, creates a clot, which creates a tamponade um, and constricts the bleeding vessels, and maybe she stops bleeding. Or if it continues to bleed, continues to bleed, she could rupture the entire placenta away, or the blood can now um, be compressed into the uterine muscle, causing um, ischemia to the uterine, to that portion of the uterine wall. Um, partial placenta, you can see here. This part of the placenta is still adhered to the uterus. This part is not, and it's bleeding, and we're seeing that bleeding. And um, hopefully we could get the bleeding stopped somehow, um, or it just clots off and stops bleeding, and that would be great, and she can continue her pregnancy or maybe do a vaginal delivery. This one here, a complete separation, um, a, a complete abruption, the entire Uterus, uh, the entire placenta has abrupted away from the uterine wall. There's no oxygenation getting to baby at all. This is an emergent C-section. Okay, plus they both could hemorrhage to death. Oops, went too far. Okay, uh, I'm going to touch on preterm labor. So preterm labor is any labor before 37 weeks. There's early preterm, there's late preterm, preterm is preterm. We don't want it if we can stop it, um, but sometimes we can't stop it. Um, they, have really, they can have really subtle signs and symptoms, such as cramping, some back pain, a little pelvic discharge, maybe some nausea, maybe some fatigue, maybe some urinary frequency. Sometimes these are things women have throughout their whole pregnancy, and they don't, they're not preterm labor, they're just... It, it's just the benefits and the loveliness of being pregnant. But so these these are subtle or vague or sometimes missed as a sign of preterm labor. Um, and then so the other thing that we would do is we would do a transvaginal ultrasound. We would look at cervical length and if it was less than one point, if it was less than 2.5 centimeters, then she's probably in preterm labor. Um, we can do a, another test called a fetal fibronectin test. Um, it's a swab test of um, uh, uh, within the vagina. We're looking for a glycoprotein um, that is produced by the fetal membranes when they rupture. Okay, um, this glycoprotein is the glue that adheres the two membrane two membranes um, to the uterus. Um, it's it's kind of like glue, okay? Um, it just the membranes just stick to the uterine wall a little bit, um, and it's that protein that um, we're looking for when the membranes rupture. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not when the membranes rupture, but it's that protein from um, um, the fetal membranes um, that will say that this person will likely go into labor within two weeks. So positive is she's likely to go into labor in two weeks. Negative is she has less than a 1% chance of giving birth. So if the woman comes in with all these signs and symptoms, we can do um, this fetal fibronectin test. And if it's positive and we see that glycoprotein, then we're probably going to keep this woman because she's likely to go into labor for two weeks, in two weeks, within two weeks. If it's negative, we'll send her home. Um, but when we do this test, we have to do it before we do our rupture, uh, before she ruptures, um, or if, well, I'm sorry. To do this test, she can't be ruptured or bleeding, and we can't do a vag exam, or she can't have had sex within 24 hours, or it will um, make an inaccurate test. Okay, sorry. So what do we do for women in preterm labor? Well, we try to stop um, contractions from starting, inhibit, or we try to reduce the contractions that she's having in strength and frequency, therefore um, reducing its ability to dilate the cervix. 
Um, and we do that by, we can hydrate her, so fluid. Um, so sometimes dehydration is the number one reason for uh, preterm labor. Um, the woman may not feel dehydrated. She may have um, the exact hydration she needs for her cells. Um, but her uterus is not a viable organ, so it's not related. It's, it doesn't go in the uh, factor of dehydration. So the woman can be have great uh, fluid balance, but her uterus can be dehydrated because she only has enough fluid um, to hydrate her cells and do her body functions. The body is going to take care of the body first, and the uterus is not a viable organ, so it's not even going to talk to the uterus until it has an abundance or an oversupply. So she can say, oh, I, I drink a lot. And I could say, well, you don't drink enough because your uterus is thirsty. Um, but the other reason for preterm labor is a UTI. So um, if we do a urine test when these women come in, uh, we get an IV started, we do a urine test. If it looks like she has a urinary tract infection, then we will possibly treat her for the UTI and hopefully stop her labor. But if we need medications specifically to stop contractions, those are called tocolytics. Cherbutaline or brethine is a drug that we give. Um, it's actually an asthma medication. It relaxes smooth muscle. It relaxes bronchial smooth muscle, but it relaxes smooth muscle, um, and the uterus is a smooth muscle. So we give 0.25 milligrams sub-Q. Um, we, can, we can repeat that in 15 minutes. Um, there are oral doses we can give if we send this patient home with those. The one bad thing about cherbutaline is it does cause tachycardia, and sometimes the women feel really, like they feel like their heart's racing and it's really uncomfortable um, and not a pleasant feeling and it kind of freaks them out sometimes. And then we may also see our fetal heart rates uh, being tacky as well. Um, so just keep that in mind um, that it will uh, return to normal as the drug wears off. Um, endomethacin or um, um, methicillin, uh, uh, methicin is... Um, or indocin. It's an NSAID um, and it works on, um, of course, um, the inflammatory responses um, um, from prostaglandins and, and cytokines which cause um, contractions. So it works to inhibit those. Um, there's a range dose. We can put the patient on this and send them home on an oral dosing of it at home. Nifedipine is also um, a medication we, go, we give. It's a calcium channel blocker. It's used for, um, blood, it's a blood pressure medication. Um, so it inhibits smooth muscle activity, uh, which the uterus is smooth muscle, so that helps. Um, and then if it's bad enough, uh, if the preterm labor is severe enough, we might even start mag sulfate. Um, mag sulfate is a black box drug, very dangerous drug, requires two RN um, doses, dosings. Um, mag magnesium sulfate is um, relaxes smooth muscle, which the uterus is. It also provides a neuroprotective benefit for the fetus, so it protects their uh, neurovasculature. Um, um, so it relaxes smooth muscle. Um, it's a four to six milligram bolus and then a two to six milligram maintenance. So typically we give a four milligram bolus in 20 minutes and then we start her on a continuous drip of two milligrams. Um, this drug is very, um, oops, oh shoot, I don't have it here. Um, this, this drug is very dangerous. It requires two RNs to sign off the dosages. Um, it could cause um, respiratory depression and um, um, mag toxic effects can cause respiratory depression, CNS depress, depression, um, and basically um, it's, it, it can be fatal if the dosing is wrong and it can be fatal quickly. All right, so the other things we're going to do for preterm labor is we're going to give mom corticosteroids. Um, the benefit of corticosteroids is to help baby, um, uh, ba help baby, um, baby's lungs mature. Um, so that we have less um, respiratory problems after a preterm birth. Um, 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 uh, less intracranial hemorrhage problems, ne less necrotizing enterocolitis problems. All these are preterm baby um, 
common preterm baby problems. So if we give these corticosteroids, um, we're hoping to prevent those or diminish their um, severity, lower their severity. Betamethasone is the drug we give most often. We can also give dexamethasone, so it's a 12 milligram IM injection. It's given every 24 hours for two doses. So you'll give your first dose and then 24 hours you'll give your second dose. Um, and then here's the dosing for um, the DEXA. Um, now, um, we're going to talk about premature rupture of membranes and preterm premature rupture of membranes. Some of the students had th these patients um, in clinicals. So this can kind of sound confusing, so, um, so listen and walk through, walk through this with me, okay? Premature rupture of membranes. Um, is the definition of, of ruptured membranes without contractions. So her water breaks and she doesn't have contractions. Her water breaks and she doesn't go into the labor of contractions. Um, and this is for the term pregnancy. Premature rupture of membranes just means the bag of waters broke prematurely as in relation to labor because labor is not starting. She's not having contractions. That's what it means to have premature rupture of membranes. Broken water with no contractions. Okay? Um, and it is of the term pregnant woman. So signs and symptoms are, of course, a gush of fluid or a trickle of fluid from the vagina. Um, when we do an, a sterile um, speculum exam, um, we have this woman laying down, and when we put that speculum in, we can see a pooling of fluid in the floor of her vagina. We can do a nitrazine strip test paper, test strip. Um, it's um, looking at the pH of the fluid, and if it turns blue, then the pH is greater than 6, which is probably amniotic fluid, because the pH of the vagina is usually about 4.5 or something like that. Um, we can do an amnesure test. An amnesure is a swab test um, that detects the protein from the placenta. Um, and then we can do a fern test, which is on a clear slide. Um, we smear, um, uh, we do a Q-tip vaginal swab. We smear it on the slide. Um, we look under it on the microscope. And um, when, we, when we see amniotic fluid under the microscope, it looks like fern. It looks like a fern leaf. So we call it the fern test. So what do we do for women who have premature rupture of membranes? Is one, we've got to know what the gestation is. Um, and she has to be term to be premature rupture of membranes. We can do an ultrasound to assess fetal growth. We can look at her amniotic fluid volume, look at um, the odor and the color of the uh, amniotic fluid. Um, we put her on bed rest. We can put her on IV antibiotics or IV fluids and, and then antibiotics. Uh, we could possibly put her on mag sulfate if we don't want her to contract. Um, oops, sorry. We can put her on, uh, we can do beta methasone um, if she's preterm, but um, she's not because um, this is after 37 weeks. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have them on the external fetal heart monitor. We're going to watch maternal vital signs basically watching for signs of infection. Um, and then um, if she's not, if she's 37 weeks and um, she's not contracting, uh, depending on your physician, we may induce labor or we may sit on her with IV antibiotics and wait for her to go into a labor. Okay, but we need to monitor, if we do that, we need to monitor mom for signs of infection. If mom starts showing signs of infection, then baby will get the infection, and that's really bad. So um, mom will tell us with her vital signs, her elevated temp. Baby will tell us with their vital sign, or with their heart rate, elevated heart rates, okay? Um, the amniotic fluid will start smelling, and um, that will be a sign of infection. Now, I don't know why I don't have this here. I'm very sorry, but make a note. Preterm premature rupture of membranes. It means the same thing. It means that her membranes are ruptured and she's not contracting. But because I've called it preterm premature rupture of membranes, that means that the woman is preterm. It's under 37 weeks. And so that is the most common diagnosis for our antepartum population in the hospital. Um, we had students this week that 
all their patients were PPROM, uh, PPROM being preterm premature rupture of membranes. Uh, one of them was 23 weeks, and I can't remember what, I think the oldest one was 34 weeks. We keep those people pregnant as long as we possibly can. We try to get them as close to term before labor as we possibly can. And the only way that we can do that is if mom shows no signs of infection and baby shows no signs of infection. Okay? All right, hypertensive disorders. Lots of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, um, and here we are classifying them. Um, Pre-pregnant um, hypertensive disorders are chronic hypertension. It's hypertension for people who are not pregnant. Um, so chronic hypertension is a type of hypertension we see in pregnancy. Okay, It was diagnosed before she was pregnant and now she's pregnant so she has chronic hypertension that does not mean she has pregnancy induced hypertension or any type of the preeclampsias okay um, preeclampsia is a hypertension over 140 over 90 on two different occasions four hours apart and it's after 20 weeks okay with proteinuria with or without edema so she has good blood pressures all the way up to 20 weeks and at 21 weeks she starts having blood pressure issues of greater than 140 over 90 um, and in addition she also has protein urea so she's spilling protein in her urine but she may or may not have edema that's not part of the diagnosis she may she may not okay um, eclampsia is um, grand mal seizures with preeclampsia so it's your patient with preeclampsia who is now seizing that's eclampsia um, preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. Oh my gosh. So she has chronic hypertension. She had hypertension before she was pregnant. But now, and she still has hypertension even though she's pregnant. But now, after 20 weeks, um, she's now spilling protein in her urine. Okay? Um, and then there's something called gestational hypertension. It's a, a temporary elevation of blood pressure and there's no proteinuria. She did not have hypertension before pregnancy. She's developed some high blood pressures now that she's pregnant, but she does not have proteinuria. Okay? Um, so that's just what they call gestational. What else are they going to call it? Okay? Um, gestational meaning pregnant. Um, transient hypertension is... Um, Gestational hypertension or hypertension with no proteinuria that continues um, uh, throughout, um, uh, continues 12 weeks postpartum. Okay, so silly, silly, silly terminology. Don't get hung up on those terms. I want you hung up on preeclampsia. Okay, um, and then we will also um, say that preeclampsia is severe. We would say preeclampsia with severe features if her blood pressure was 160 over 110 and she was spilling greater than 500 uh, milligrams of protein in a 24-hour urine, okay? So it's still preeclampsia. It's just worse preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a progressive disease. Um, there's no cure for it. If there was a cure for it, it would be delivery of the placenta um, and not being pregnant anymore. Um, but here are some things about preeclampsia. So we do know some things about preeclampsia. It's a multi-system. In other words, it affects many systems in the body. It's a vasopressive process. Okay. It targets the cardiovascular system. It tar targets the hematologic system, the hepatic, the renal, and the central nervous system. So our assessments are going to be looking at those body systems. Okay. They call it a disease of the placenta because when the placenta finally starts getting mature and, and, um, and um, um, uh, producing their own hormones, um, usually somewhere after the 20-week um, age gestation, then those hormones or thinking those hormones may contribute to the development of preeclampsia. Um, but anyways, um, it's a disease of the placenta. Um, trophoblast cells, which you haven't learned about yet, which we will at some point in, in our OB education, they do not completely transform the uterine spiral arteries 
um, uh, to form that placental network. Um, so we have acute atherosis forming, um, and then we have infarcted areas on the placenta, um, and therefore there's no um, oxygen exchange at that area of the placenta. Um, but a little deeper um, pathophysiologically, um, oh, sorry, preeclampsia is uh, vasospasm of the vessels of the blood vessels and, 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 and the endothelial cell damage or the lining uh, endothelial cells of the vasculature, it's damage to them. All right. Now, does the vasospasm cause the damage to the cells or does the damage to the cells cause the vasospasm? Uh, who knows, um, but that's what's going on in the vest in the vasculature. Um, we have vasospasm and we have endothelial cell damage. So um, uh, we have um, plasma um, uh, leaking interstitially. Okay, um, uh, this causes restriction of blood flow, of course, um, and 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 the um, endothelial damage uh, stimulates. Um, the use of platelets to repair the the damage okay and then so you'll see why we look at platelet counts um, this causes um, hypoxemia and then hypoxic issues at the organ level okay um, decreased plasma volume because we have the cell damage so we have we're third spacing into the interstitial this activates the coagulation and a uh, cascade and the platelets um, and fibrinogen utilization um, which will then ultimately affect the glomer the glomerulus in the kidneys um, and affect the glomerular filtration rate sorry can't speak um, now in addition to that those physical responses um, we have in pregnancy an exaggerated response to angiotensin II. Remember normal pathophysiology um, or normal ANP angiotensin II um, is part of the uh, renin aldosterone angiotensin um, um, process in the kidneys and so we're um, we're producing a normal amount of angiotensin um, but we have an ex exaggerated response to it, therefore it's elevating our blood pressure, okay? Um, angiotensin II constricts and, um, and so it causes the hypertension, right? So we have an exaggerated response to angiotensin II. And then two other um, um, compounds, prostacycline and uh, thromboxane. Prostacycline is a vasodilator, so that would cause us to not be hypertensive. It would cause our blood pressure to lower. And then thromboxane is another compound um, that causes um, high blood pressure, or it's a vasoconstrictor, and it causes high blood pressure. Now, in pregnancy, um, the um, the balance between prostacycline and thromboxane are um, well, they're in an imbalance, so we don't have as much prostacycline circulating. That that's the vasodilator, and then we have too much thromboxane uh, circulating, and that's the vasoconstrictor. So there's another reason why our blood pressures are elevated in preeclampsia. Okay, so that's just a little basement um, patho for you. Um, when you have a patient who's preeclamptic, if you want to remember the mnemonic spasms, remember um, they're, they're, they have vasospasms. So if you want to remember spasms, you can, um, you can name some of the criteria for preeclampsia. So S stands for significant blood pressure changes. Um, P stands for proteinuria. A stands for arterial spasms resulting in endothelial damage and leak of leakage of intravascular fluid into the interstitial spaces. Okay. Um, the other S stands for significant lab changes. 
So we see um, changes in our liver function. We see changes in our platelets. As we start using up our platelets, we start dropping our platelets. We may start seeing kidney, I don't have it on here, but kidney function, so it affects our kidney. Um, we might see changes in our CNS, in our level of consciousness, in our vision, um, um, because um, it causes changes in all those multi-organ involvement, okay? Um, and then um, the symptoms are after 20 weeks. So that was pretty over-the-top explanation. Um, here is um, uh, a concept mapped if this is how you learn better. So we start with um, um, our hypertension, um, which we have our vasospasm, our endothelial damage, and then what that leads to, and then what that leads to, and then what that leads to in our different organ systems. Okay, so this is a good way to kind of learn the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Okay, um, what do we do? Um, well, we deliver the baby. Um, that's the only cure. <laughs> Um, or deliver the placenta. Now, preeclampsia without severe features, we do a conservative management. So that is your blood pressure that's just over 140 over 90, um, and she's spilling 300 milligrams of protein in her urine. Um, that's without severe features. She's not having any other signs and symptoms, okay? Um, we, we manage her diet. We keep her hydrated. We want her to rest. Um, and be on her left side. Um, we will be repeating her labs to watch to make sure that other organ systems are not starting to feel the effects of preeclampsia. And then we will do a weekly or bi-weekly evaluation of the baby until the woman goes into, into labor, okay? Or until she gets term or goes into labor or we decide the baby needs delivered. Now, preeclampsia with severe features is a blood pressure greater than 160 over 110. She has increasing proteinuria over 500 milligrams in a 24-hour urine. She starts having visual changes. Um, she starts having um, epigastric pain, so right epigastric pain, which is liver pain because she's having liver involvement, which is causing nausea and vomiting. She may have bleeding of the gums as, we start, as she starts utilizing or using up her platelets. Um, she'll start having headaches as she, she, we start getting vascular um, uh, constriction in the brain. Um, we're going to have that increasing edema as um, the endothelial damage increases and she starts third spacing her intravascular fluid, decreasing urinary output because now we're affecting the kidneys, um, decreased fetal movement because now we're, we also have um, vessels in the placenta which are being constricted and have an endothelial damage and infarcts and all those kind of things and we're not getting oxygenation to our baby so our baby is not going to be wanting to move because they don't have oxygen okay so they're, cons they're in conservation mode right here and the patient just might say I'm not feeling well okay I just don't feel right I just feel and, and that's very vague and um, can be a big problem for um, for nurses if a patient says, I don't feel right. Um, scary, scary stuff. So we hospitalize our patient. We decide whether or not we need to deliver now. If we do, can she have a vaginal delivery or does she need a C-section? She's on a fetal monitor. We've got IVs going. Um, we're watching her vital signs with oxygen saturations very frequently. And she does have an indwelling Foley catheter in now. Um, frequent nursing assessments. We're going to be watching these labs. We're going to do this 24-hour urine if we haven't done it already. We're going to be doing serial labs here um, to watch um, uh, how um, her preeclampsia is affecting her body systems. And and then we may put her on mag sulfate. Mag sulfate, remember, is the drug that we're going to give if she's in preterm labor. Um, we're also going to give that if she um, is has preeclampsia and the reason why we give that is to prevent seizures so it uh, lowers her seizure threshold we may give her antihypertensive uh, mag sulfate as a side effect causes hypotension so sometimes we drop their blood pressures a little bit when we give mag sulfate but it's not consistent or uh, dropped enough to be a actual antihypertensive um, so we may give additional antihypertensives um, depending on how high her blood pressures are. Um, okay, so I told you mag sulfate was a high alert or a black box drug. It's very um, 
uh, very toxic. Uh, she can get very toxic very easily. So we can draw serum mag levels um, every four to six hours. Ouch. Why? If we, if we, all we need to do is vigilant assessments. And the thing that embarrasses me is we don't do vigilant assessments in CMC. So, um, anyways, but we do vigilant assessments. From our assessments, we can tell what our patient's mag level is without drawing a serum mag level. So if we were to draw a serum mag level, the normal serum magnesium level for adults, not pregnant, male or female, is about 1.5 to 2 milliequivalents. Okay? Um, but if we're running mag sulfate, we need her mag level to be between 4 and 7 milliequivalents. Okay, so if we did a mag sulfate level uh, and lab got like 6.5 milli equivalents, they'd be calling us and saying, I have a critical high value, um, which if this was my 40-year-old uh, male patient, yes, that would be bad, um, but it's not. It's my pregnant patient, and I need her to be 4 to 7 for the mag sulfate to have its therapeutic um, anti-seizure um, effects. Now, with my vigilant assessment, if I had her on an ECG, which we don't, um, I would see changes in her ECG if her mag levels were 5 to 10 milli equivalents, but we don't have them on an ECG when, when we have them on mag. However, we will do um, check her, tendon re her deep tendon reflexes if she loses her deep tendon reflexes. In other words, you assessed her deep tendon reflexes um, in the morning before you put her on the mag, and they were normal, plus two. If she was toxic, they would be zero. She would have no reflexes. Then you would know that her mag level was between 8 to 12 milliequivalents. If she started having breathing issues, you know your mag levels are above 15. And if her heart stops beating, then you know her mag levels are above 25. Um, people's argument for not doing serum mag levels or for doing serum mag levels instead of assessments is one are you doing vigilant assessments and number two how quickly a patient can go from therapeutic to toxic um, and did we catch it soon enough well there's going to be no difference in my opinion if you wait an hour to do an assessment or you wait four hours to draw a lab um, I think my assessments are going to find it quicker Okay, but my assessments have to be accurate. All right. Um, so anyways, we identify her protein, her preeclampsia. She has hypertension. She has proteinuria. Um, her urine output we assess. Uh, we want um, to watch her urine every one to four hours. Um, if she has less than 30 cc's, and some physicians will say 60 cc's in an hour, then um, she... Uh, she has low urine output that's now being affected by magnesium sulfate. Um, edema, um, or even her preeclampsia, but probably her mag sulfate. Edema, um, uh, she may have peripheral edema, okay, but if she starts having pulmonary edema, then we have a problem. So we need to be listening to her lungs every hour, okay? Um, CNS alterations, does she have a headache? Is she having visual problems? Um, um, is she having um, level of consciousness problems? Um, then uh, we might have an issue with her preclamps with her blood pressures. Um, remember, if she has a seizure, it's called eclampsia. Now we will assess her DTRs. Um, they're either going to be absent or one to four. Um, brisk DTRs, where she's three or four, um, mean that she's hyperreflexic, meaning that she um, is at risk for having a seizure. Okay, if her DTRs are two, that's great. If they were two and now they're one or zero, then we're losing our DTRs and our mag sulfate is too high, or uh, she's getting toxic with her mag. We check for clonus. We want her clonus to be absent. If it is present, that means she's hyper uh, reflexic, and we count the number of beats that her foot bounces. And then again, we assess her level of consciousness. We already said eclampsia is a grand mal seizure. Um, her, uh, she has severe hypertension. She probably has plus four 
protein on dipstick. She has generalized edema. She has brisk reflexes, plus four. Um, she has clonus, um, however many beats, one or two or three, it doesn't matter, but she has clonus. Um, that could be her symptoms, or she could have mild hypertension. She could have no proteinuria. She could have no edema, and she could have normal reflexes, um, and then she has a grand mal seizure. So this is the person that says, yeah, I don't feel right, but you don't have really any concrete anything else to go on, except she doesn't feel right, and then she has a grand mal seizure. Um, anyways, here's your complications. Uh, seizures, uh, you know, they're self-limiting, so they only last a few minutes. However, um, I have a horror story of a patient who came to my floor in a wheelchair by her husband. She says, I don't feel well. She was diaphoretic, uh, red-faced, um, dilated pupils. We put her in the bed. We took her blood pressure. It was like 210 over 180, or I don't know what it was. It was crazy high, and she seized. And she did not stop seizing until we got her into OR and um, got her under anesthesia. That's when she stopped seizing, so it was a lot longer than four minutes. But anyways, in general, they last four minutes, okay? Um, so what happens when your patient has a seizure? Don't panic. Um, pad the rails. Try to protect your patient from injury. Try to prevent um, an aspiration by lying the patient on the side, on their side. Have suction equipment available. Have an oral airway if you need it. Do not put your fingers in this patient's mouth. Um, maintain oxygenation, so you might have to put a face mask on her. Um, get the mag sulfate going. Uh, get lab up there to do a blood gas. Um, get your baby on the monitor if you can. Um, and um, plan for delivery. She's probably going to be a C-section. HELP syndrome is a mnemonic for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. So this is another complication of um, severe preeclampsia. Um, when we start having multiple system or, uh, organ damage, um, we start uh, seeing all these things. So hemolysis, so because of the vasoconstriction, uh, because of the end, uh, because of the vasospasms, we start hemolysing, okay? Um, so we'll see that on our CBC. Um, the vasospasms decrease blood flow to the liver, resulting in ischemia and hemorrhage and necrosis of the liver. So that's when we'll start seeing our elevated liver enzymes. Um, remember with the endothelial, uh, the vasospasm and endothelial damage, we'll start uh, utilizing our platelets. So we'll start eating up our platelets and we'll, and this is happening so fast that we don't have time to replace them. So we'll see a low platelet count. The patient may complain of right epigast upper gastric pain, which is um, because of her liver uh, involvement. They will have malaise, flu-like symptoms, maybe have nausea and vomiting. Uh, they'll have a headache, shoulder pain. Uh, they'll be bruising um, because they're hemolysing um, um, and bleeding, and, st and they're going to start bleeding because they're using up their platelets. They're going to activate their fibrinogen and their clotting cascade. Um, they're going to ha start having bleeding in the urine. They're going to start bleeding from all orifices, their eyes, their nose, their gums, uh, puncture wounds, IV sites, um, um, and may even have GI bleeds. Who knows, okay? Um, so anyways, the treatment is to improve platelet levels um, with fresh frozen pla and, and giving fresh frozen plasma and delivering the fetus. There's no like stabilizing this woman and everything going well and the baby doing well and then she continues pregnant. Um, this is end organ damage. This is organ damage and it's, gonna, it's a progressive disease. It's going to get worse and worse and worse so we need to get the baby out. Now, this is another complication, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, DIC for people who can't speak like me. Um, this is not pregnancy related, it is bleeding related, so it could be anybody who's having a massive bleed. Um, DIC is, um, they're having um, uh, microvascular coagulation and bleeding because they're clotting um, in response to the bleeding, they're using up their clotting factors, they can't produce enough clotting factors, um, so they're trying to clot, they have immature microclots, um, but they're still bleeding, so this is what it is. Um, this is an emergent, emergent situation. Um, of course, we need to do meticulous maternal and fetal assessments. 
we need to place an indwelling catheter, we need to place oxygen, we need to get blood products on board, um, and we need to, this is a resuscitation, like this woman is circling the drain dying right here in front of your eyes. So massive amounts of blood products, massive amounts, okay? Get the baby delivered, um, and then we need to stabilize mom. We need to replace her blood products, we need to replace clotting factors, okay? Um, and then hopefully stabilize this woman. Um, without permanent damage to her or the baby. Okay, uh, multiple gestation. I'm bringing this up because there's some confusion about twins. Okay, so everybody knows there's identical twins and non-identical twins. Um, non-identical non twins are what we call fraternal or dizygotic twins. I'll explain this here in a minute. But basically what it means is Di meaning two, zygotes meaning fertilized eggs. There's two separate eggs that got fertilized. Okay, that doesn't usually happen. The woman, when she ovulates, I don't know the percentage, but I'm just going to say 99% of the time she ovulates one egg. But this time, for some reason, she ovulated two eggs. They both got fertilized. Those are two separate identical, those are two separate individuals, just like I am separate from a separate individual as my sister who's two years older than me. That's what fraternal twins are, or non-identical or dizygotic. We're two totally separate individuals, okay? Um, identical twins are what we call monozygotic, one um, fertilized egg twins. So it's a single fertilized egg. It's a normal pregnancy. Um, a normal fertilized egg that for some reason during its maturation process, um, the cell division process, it splits into two separate eggs. Okay, that's identical. That's, um, that's eggs with um, one set of DNA that just has been split in half. So the same DNA. Um, so identical twins. Um, or two separate fetuses from one fertilized ovum that splits. The timing of the sp split determines how many placentas there are and how many bags of water there are. And that's important um, in identical twins um, is to determine that because with each different scenario, the risk increases for the fetuses. So here are the types of monozygotic twins. Mono being one, zygotic meaning fertilized egg, okay? That splits, so these are identical. If they have two placentas and two bags of waters, they're called dichorionic, diamniotic. Two chorions, two amnions. Um, these are, I'm sorry, these are, two, the chorionic membrane um, um, develops into the placenta. So if we have two chorions, um, we, we have two um, placentas and two bags of water. So sometimes, though, the two placentas, they fuse, um, making one big, single, huge placenta. Okay. Anyways, so we have two chorions, two amnions. Um, the chorion is the outer membrane. The amnion is the inner, inner membrane. So we have two of them. And what that means is during the development after the egg was fertilized, um, the split happened in the first three days of fertilization, after fertilization. So these two weren't developed yet. So when the split happened, then they developed um, one uh, amnion, one chorion on one twin, one amnion, one chorion on the other twin. Okay? I'm sorry, that was confusing. So two and two. Now, mono chorionic or, or di and diamniotic is one chorion, one outer membrane, one placenta, and two amnions, two inner membranes. Okay, so that split happened within four to eight days after fertilization. So um, the chorion um, uh, was already developed. The amnion was not, so that's why it was able to develop into two. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, now, monochorionic, monoamniotic, one chorion, 
one amnion, um, that means uh, the division happened after the first week. The chorion and the amnion were already developed, and then the split happened, and so now we have the two fetuses in the in each in this membrane. Okay, this is the most dangerous one. Um, this is the highest risk one. Um, and then this is the next, and then this is the least, okay? Um, in, in a bag of waters, you have two babies sharing everything from blood supply to placenta to oxygenation to everything. Um, and so that is a huge risk. Um, we can have twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. We can have um, all kinds of problems develop here. Here, we can also have twin-to-twin -twin transfusion because we have the one single placenta uh, shared, and then they're, they're um, both in their own amniotic, sing, uh, inner layer amniotic sac, okay? So this one's, um, again, the least um, risky of the three, and then this one's the least risky of them all. All right. Um, diagnosis, of course, is by ultrasound. Um, and then um, we could have elevated HCG levels um, from the different, from the placentas, okay? Um, so diagnosing chorionicity, uh, usually it can be done around 10 to 13 weeks. Um, die, die, meaning two chorions, two amnions. Um, we, they will see um, the plus, sorry. Anyways, so they can see the, the, um, the different layers of the um, amnions and chorions. They can see the different membranes. And then um, here on the mono dye, so they have the absence of the intervening uh, placenta um, tissue between the membranes. So they can see the one and see the two sacs, okay? Um, what's the management for uh, twins? Well, really nothing unless the woman starts having problems. Um, but we will, um, you know, be doing surveillance on this woman um, early in her pregnancy um, to make sure that the babies are doing fine and that their growth is good. Um, if anything is uh, apparent with the growth of one or the health of one and not the other, um, then we will hospitalize this woman um, until delivery. And then she has to deliver at a tertiary center, which we are a tertiary center. We deliver twins and triplets. I think we deliver triplets um, at CMC, but if they have more than triplets, they have to go to somewhere else. I don't know where. I think it's, I can't remember if it's Spokane or Salt Lake or Seattle or, or where. But anyways. Um, okay. Uh, problems during pregnancy. of Infections. I already told you that UTIs are the most common cause one of the most common reasons for premature contractions. So if she has a UTI, we need to give her antibiotics. Um, you know, a lot of times we can give her PO antibiotics and send her home, but if it's a really bad um, pyelonephritis, then um, she may need to be hospitalized on IV antibiotics. Um, but if it's just, you know, normal, normal UTI, um, she can be on a PO dose and sent home, okay? Um, GBS, so this is a very important um, infection in pregnancy. Um, group beta strep, uh, streptococcus, or GBS. It's a normal fecal vaginal flora. Half of us have it, half of us don't. It's not a problem for us. However, it is a problem for a fetus being born through a vagina that that's, uh, has a normal flora of GBS. Uh, babies will... Um, um, become infected and um, may become septic and it can be fatal to babies in a, in a short period of time. So what we do is we test all pregnant women um, around 36 weeks gestation for GBS status. If it comes back positive, we note that in her chart and then when she's admitted into labor, she is given antibiotics throughout her labor, usually penicillin. And that is not to cure her or eradicate her uh, GBS status, um, but it's to protect the baby from contracting GBS infection, okay? So 
If the woman is positive on that test, um, she gets the antibiotic. If the woman was not tested for some reason, then we're going to go ahead and treat her anyway, just in case. Um, and no harm, no foul. Okay. Um, please review the torch infections um, in the textbook. I'm not going to go over those. We do test for torch um, infection, um, toxoplasmosis. We te test for hep B. Some physicians do hep C. We test syphilis. Um, we test HIV um, and rubella status. Um, I don't usually see physicians testing for uh, cytomegaly, but we do do um, hepatitis. Um, we do do um, herpes, and um, and some physicians will do chlamydia and gonorrhea um, in their prenatal panel. Um, so here goes over some of those. Um, um, STI infections. Um, I'm not going to read these to you. Please go over these. We do treat these um, for the women, of course, but also to prevent uh, transmission to baby. Um, so please look over these. Um, now, this is one of the things I really wanted to talk about and explain because this can be very confusing. Um, hemolytic disease of the fetus is um, uh, mainly caused by um, ABO or RH and mainly RH rarely ever ABO incompatibilities so hemolytic disease of the baby is there is a lysis um, a hemolysis of fetal or neonatal red blood cells fetal being a baby in utero neonatal being a baby not in utero um, so they have a hemolysis okay um, and uh, the, the main culprit is an RH incompatibility so um, if there is an RH compatibility where there is an immune response um, to RH factor, then that is called isoimmunization or alloimmunization or sensit uh, sensitized or sensit sensitization, okay? Um, either one of those terms are correct um, to say that... Um, there is an incompatibility of RH. So let's look at what happens. So RH is um, the antigen or lack of antigen on the red blood cell, the RH antigen. Um, RH negative women do not have the RH antigen. RH po oh, I'm sorry. RH positive people have the RH antigen on the red blood cells, okay? So if a mother is RH negative, she does not have the antigen. If the baby is Rh positive, then what's going to happen is mom's blood is going to see that antigen on the baby's red blood cells, and mom's blood is going to create antibodies to attack that. Okay? So if mom creates antibodies, then she's isoimmunized, she's sensitized, she's alloimmunized. Okay? Um, all the same words. Um, so if mom's Rh negative, if baby is Rh positive, if mom has created antibodies, then she has been sensitized to baby's Rh positive antigen, okay? Um, and the way mother gets exposed to baby's Rh positive blood is by a transfusion of Rh positive blood by mistake. If she had a previous spontaneous or even elective abortion where she was negative and the baby was positive, okay, if she had an intra, um, invasive intrauterine procedure that caused a bleed, um, then she could possibly be exposed to baby's blood. If she has a placenta previa or a placenta abruption, remember we said if mom is negative and not sensitized, we're going to give the rogam. Um, during a cesarean section, during labor, um, and if a previous um, pregnancy uh, was the baby was Rh positive, then mom could become sensitized, okay? So in all these situations, this is where the mother gets exposed to Rh positive blood. Um, and if she gets exposed to Rh positive blood and mom is Rh negative, she will create antibodies against that Rh-positive antigen, okay? All right. 
Now, so prenatally, we do mom's ABO and RH, you know, like at her first visit, okay? Um, if the woman is RH negative, um, then we will do what's called an indirect Coombs test on mom. And that will determine whether or not she has antibodies or whether she has created antibodies to RH positive blood. So if she had a previous exposure. If that direct Coombs comes back positive, that means she's had an exposure, she's already created antibodies, there's nothing we can do except monitor the pregnancy. We can't eradicate those antibodies that she created. Do you see? Um, if we do the direct Coombs test and, and it's negative, that means she does not or did not produce antibodies, then, um, then we say life is great. And if her pregnancy continues without any of these things happening, then at 20 weeks, or 28 weeks, sorry, at 28 weeks, we do the test again, and if it's negative, we give her Rogam, 300 milligrams IM. And that is to prevent her from making antibodies. Okay, do you understand that? We did, a, we did an antibody screen, this indirect Coombs test. She had no antibodies, so now we're going to give this medication um, because she's going to have a baby and she's going to be exposed to fetal blood cells, and we do not want her creating antibodies. So we give the Rogam at 28 weeks, prevent antibody formation. That lasts for three months, and that will usually get her to the end of pregnancy where she delivers her baby. Um, specifically, Rogam um, uh, prevents mom from forming antibodies by coding and destroying the fetal blood cells that are in the maternal circulation. Therefore, the mom's blood cells don't see that and don't create the antibodies, okay? Um, and then so this, this Rogam injection at 28 weeks lasts her three months, then she delivers her baby. We test the baby, and if the baby is RH positive, we'll do a Clyhara Becky test on mom um, to establish whether mom has fetal blood cells um, we will do, um, a, we may do a direct Coombs test on baby. The direct Coombs on baby tells us whether um, there was any antibody destruction of fetal cells. Um, but anyways, if baby's positive and all the other things are negative, we will give mom another Rogam injection, okay? If we deliver the baby and the baby is RH negative, we don't have to do anything. Okay, all right. Um, RH negative mom gets an indirect Coombs to test for antibodies. We already talked about that. If positive antibodies are present, that means she's sensitized. There's nothing we can do but monitor the pregnancy. Um, we can repeat the um, indirect Coombs test frequently to see if those titers are rising. Um, that will kind of tell us the um, the re fight response she's mounting towards fetal cells, but um, those antibodies of moms, they cross the placenta, so they attack baby on baby's side. Um, the antibodies do. Okay, we can do an amniocentesis um, to look for um, the optical density of the amniotic fluid um, and uh, the optical density is created by bili the presence of bilirubin. Bilirubin is the product of red blood cell breakdown. So if we're detecting that in the amniotic fluid, we know that baby is, is experiencing some level of hemolysis. Okay, So if optical density is low, that means the fetus is Rh negative. Um, and there's no pro there's no problems. Okay, baby's not breaking down red blood cells. But if the optimal density is elevated again, then the baby is experiencing a hemolysis, um, and um, you know we need to. There's nothing we can do to stop this process. We can just monitor it and then try to deal with baby after birth. Um, maternal antibodies cross the placenta, destroy the fetal red blood cells. Um, then the baby starts developing a red blood cell deficiency. Um, baby's bilirubin levels rise. Bilirubin, again, is the product of red blood cell breakdown. 
um, and then baby can suffer from an icterus gravis, um, uh, which can progress to severe neurologic um, problems, or bilirubin encephalopathy, where now the brain is, is affected by the bilirubin, and this is, um, depending on the damage, it is irreversible, okay? Um, this also triggers, um, uh, you know, babies as babies' red blood cells are breaking down, babies trying to reproduce them, producing immature red blood cells that cannot carry oxygen. So we get this ureth uh, urethroblastosis fatalis. It's basically, um, um, you know, um, basically uh, a, a hypoxic state, an anemic hypoxic state. As the fetal anemia uh, progresses and we start to develop a, an edema throughout the baby, a fatal edema, it's called hydrops fatalis. And then baby progresses to a congestive heart failure and dies. So, um, for fetal hemolysis, of course, we can do the ultrasound. We can do an ultrasound to assess, to assess the fetal anemia. How much edema does the baby have? Is there any ascites building up in the peritoneal cavity? Uh, do we have an enlarged heart? Do we have a large um, uh, uh, amniotic fluid volume, hydramnios? We can do a percutaneous umbilical um, blood sampling uh, to, to have a quantitative um, level of uh, red blood cell destruction. This is uh, basically doing a blood draw uh, for a CBC, basically, in utero, okay? Um, intrauterine blood transfusion, we've done this on several occasions at Community. It's so awesome to be a part of. Um, the baby is still pregnant, or the woman is still pregnant, but we are transfusing the baby with O negative blood through the umbilical cord um, and giving the baby the blood volume and uh, that they need, okay? Um, anyways, that's what we would do to pr prevent, um, all these, um, all these previously mentioned, um, complications from RH uh, sensitization, okay? Now, as far as ABO incompatibilities, those occur when mother is blood group O, so mother is carrying no antigens, um, mothers who carry, um, antigen um, or anti-A or anti-B antibodies. Um, um, so if the baby is born with an A or B, then those anti-A, anti-B antibodies um, will attack those blood, those blood cells. We do a direct Coombs to um, uh, determine if there's any antibodies present in the neonate's blood. We do an indirect Coombs to test if mom has produced any antibodies. Um, and then manage the babe, the mom and babe afterwards. Um, but this is, even though we have mothers that are O type and we have babies that are A, B, A or B or A, B type, um, though these, the, the incompatibility problems are almost undetectable. We might see a baby who's a little bit jaundice, um, and then it resolves. So we don't really ever even do anything. And as a matter of fact, some hospitals don't even test when mom's, a when mom's ABO is O. So it's very, uh, very rare complications. So um, we don't really do a lot about it. Now, let's talk a little bit about diabetes. So a person can be diabetic before they become pregnant, type one or type two, you guys are aware of those, um, or they can develop gestational diabetes or diabetes that develops because of pregnancy. Um, it usually develops later in pregnancy and we'll discuss why. Um, we manage it hopefully with diet and exercise. Um, occasionally we will give medications or insulin for it. Um, and then um, uh, she's at risk for de developing uh, uh, overt diabetes later in life if she's had gestational diabetes. Now. Um, the developing uh, fetus and placenta uh, produce hormones that change the way carbohydrates and protein um, and fat are metabolized. So um, usually in the first part of the pregnancy, those hormones are not enough to cause an effect. Um, and um, the first part of pregnancy is 
um, kind of like the fat storage part of pregnancy um, uh, to get ready to support the long um, pregnancy. And then in the second part of pregnancy, when the, the fetal hormones and the placental hormones are uh, producing enough to cause um, changes in the carbohydrate metabolism, um, we also will see an increase in um, insulin resistance. So we will see that um, hyperglycemia in the second part of pregnancy. Okay. Oh, oh shoot. Mommy. Sorry. Mommy. Um, anyways. So um, when, when mom has diabetes of any form, um, the baby uh, gets um, glucose from the placenta. Okay, so whatever glucose, whatever blood glucose mom has, um, baby's getting that level of blood glucose as well. Okay, and then baby's body, uh, insulin does not cross the placenta um, from mom, so baby produces their own insulin. So they have high insulin because of mom's high blood sugar. Okay, and then of course we know what insulin does. Um, it's, it causes us to have big babies. Um, and a big baby is called macrosomia. Also, high insulin levels cause a uh, decrease in um, pulmonary surfactant pr production. Surfactant is what the baby produces um, towards the end of pregnancy to um, put surface tension on those alveoli so that they don't collapse after expiration, okay? So we need babies to produce the surfactant. Um, we screen um, all pregnant women at 24 to 28 weeks when um, that second part of pregnancy, uh, when they have an insulin resistance and all those placental and fetal hormones are causing a change in our carbohydrate production, uh, uh, breakdown and stuff like that, metabolism. Um, all pregnant women are tested between 24 and 28 weeks. The patients that are, are uh, coming to your pregnant that have clinical risk factors, we will screen them earlier. Okay, uh, there's two different types of screenings. The first screening is the glucose challenge test or the glucola screening. It's a 50 gram oral glucose solution that they drink and, and then they check their blood sugar one hour later. Um, if their blood sugar is um, above 130 to 140, depending on what the obstetrician prefers the range be, um, then they have to do the three-hour glucose test. Some obstetricians just do the three-hour glucose test. Why do this test? If you think you might have to do this test, just do this test. It's a three-hour oral glucose um, tolerance test. Um, we have to do a fasting blood sugar. Then they drink their 100 gram oral um, glucose uh, solution. Then we recheck their glucose at one hour, two hours, and three hours. Um, they can't drink caffeine or they can't smoke um, 12 hours uh, prior to the test. And, of course, they have to be fasting because we need to do a fasting glucose level. Um, now, to be diagnosed with uh, gestational diabetes, they have to have two or more elevated values. So their fasting should be below, one, uh, be below 95. They're one hour after drinking should be below 180, their two hours should be below 155, and their three hours should be below 140. Two of these have to be um, greater than, or two of these have to be elevated, and then she will be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. They will see about managing her with diet. Um, so the obstetrician, maybe the internist, I, I know obstetricians consult with endocrinologists, especially with the patients that have overt diabetes. Um, anyways, um, they might consult with a, a diabetic educator to, to do um, nutrition. They might do a nutritionist or a dietitian. Anyways, they would be consulting with the neonatologist, especially if they feel like they might have a baby with problems after delivery. Okay, They need to set her up with home blood glucose monitoring. And usually, typically, what they'll have them do is um, they may have them do a resting or uh, fasting blood glucose. They may have them do a preparandial uh, glucose testing, in other words, an AC test. Um, but they will definitely do a two-hour postparandial 
so two hours after their meals, and they want their glucoses to be 120. If they can adjust their diet and physical activity to keep their blood glucoses normal, that's great. If not, then they'll have to go for medication. Um, they're definitely going to need to be uh, referred to a perinatologist for further uh, monitoring of the pregnancy. Um, they're going to be doing ultrasounds. Um, they're going to be doing estimated baby weights, baby sizes. Um, they're going to be looking at their amniotic fluid volume, uh, watching for cardiac defects, central nervous system defects, um, and, and of course any other complications. Um, if she ends up on um, oral hypoglycemics or insulin, um, she could do subcutaneous insulin, subcutaneous pumps. She can use insulin pens. She could be on a short and rapid acting combination cocktail. Um, um, she can do coverage um, um, based on um, a four dose regimen, a bedtime regimen. Um, we don't do um, uh, hypoglycemics, but we can do these oral sulfonylureas because they don't cross, cross the placenta. Uh, the hypoglycemics cross the placenta, um, and we don't want to do that for babies. All right, um, venous thrombosis or embolus. I'm going to go through this quickly. Just know that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. We've got increased blood, uh, blood volume. Um, we've got this large uterus growing um, in the belly, causing maybe causing pressure on the pelvic veins and the leg veins, uh, which causes um, you know uh, decreased venous return out of the lower extremities. Um, all these things, and sometimes in you know less activity out of mom. Um, all these components here. Um, and, and, and the pregnant woman's hypercoagulable state put her at risk for de developing DVTs, okay? So we need to educate mom about that. We need to assess for that at her visits. Um, and then if we suspect DVT, of course, uh, we need to use ultrasound. Um, and if she, uh, if we are suspecting uh, a PE, if she, uh, if, she, if she dislodged the clot into her lung, then we need to do, do a VQ scan. But anyways, if, if she has developed a blood clot, at risk for developing a blood clot, or has a blood clot history, she will probably be on Lovenox um, prenatally, and then, of course, bed rest. Um, but then if she's in labor, then she will be on a, probably be on a heparin drip during labor. Um, and then lastly, um, complications in pregnancy, of course, are the psychiatric complications. Your patient may have a depressive disorder before pregnancy. Pregnancy may, be, may cause a depression, especially if this pregnancy is non-wanted, if she lives in a violent house, um, if this was a rape, whatever. Like depression can be a problem for this woman. She could have a baseline bipolar disorder. Um, she could have schizophrenia. She could have an anxiety disorder. Um, eating disorders um, are bad enough, but if you add a pregnancy on top of that, then they're just devastating um, for the growth and health of the pregnancy, as well as, uh, you know, depending on the severity of these eating disorders, um, like your anorexias or your bulimias, um, the safety of the mom as well. And, of course, you hear a lot about pica, um, where... Um, the woman craves non-food items, um, and then um, substance abuse um, is a huge problem in pregnancy, um, and then therefore then becomes a huge problem with the baby after delivery. So look over those sections. Um, oh crap! I thought we were almost we are almost done. I'm sorry. I know this one's a long one. Um, okay, the last thing I want to go over just really quickly is some fetal assessment tests. Um, I'm just going to um, explain um, briefly uh, CVS and the pubs test, uh, chorionic villa sampling. Um, this is taking samples from the chorionic membrane or the trophoblastic cells to test for um, problems with the baby. Okay, um, this is done at 10 to 12 weeks. 
Um, it's done through guided ultrasound. Um, they insert a catheter um, into the uterus and they get a sample of that, uh, uh, those chorionic cells. Okay, Risks, of course, are infection. Any invasive procedure, there's a risk for infection. Um, uh, because it's at 10 to 12 weeks, we may cause a fetal loss. Um, we may cause a rupture of membranes at 10 to 12 weeks. Um, we could cause an RH isoimmunization if the mom was RH negative and that fetus was RH positive. So when we're doing a CVS, we will, um, of a mom who's RH negative, we will do an indirect comb, see if she's produced any antibodies. If she has not, we will probably give her um, Rogam, okay, because this could cause an ISO immunization. And then we could also cause a fetal limb reduction. That is just a very politically correct way of saying we may sever a body part from the baby. At 10 to 12 weeks, scraping a cell sample, we may accidentally cut a arm off or something really bad, okay? Um, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling is a getting a sample of fetal blood um, right from the umbilical cord. Uh, we can do these after 18 weeks. It's guided ultrasound. We insert the needle through um, um, the, the, the uterus to the umbilical cord and draw our sample. Of course, our risks are going to be uh, possible cord laceration. We could cause a thromboembolus. We could cause preterm labor. We could cause a preterm birth. We could cause a premature rupture of membranes, um, and we can cause infection, okay? Um, amniocentesis, removal of amniotic fluid from, um, from the uterus. Uh, we can do this after 12 weeks under ultrasound guidance. We stick a needle through the uterus. We pull out amniotic fluid. We can test for chromosomalities, abnormalities, lung maturity infection, blah, 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 blah. Here's our risks. Of course, we could cause a rupture of membranes. We could cause a preterm labor, a preterm birth, infection. We can injure the fetus. Uh, we could cause fetal death. We can cause an isoimmunization if the mom is RH negative and that baby was RH positive. So we'll probably be giving her Rogam if we do an indirect Coombs and see that mom has not produced any antibodies. Um, we could do a fetal lung maturity test. This is what we're looking for. I'm not going to go over that because we rarely do them anymore. But just know this is going to tell us these proteins are going to tell us whether or not we have lung uh, mature lungs, okay? Which we rarely do that anymore. An amnioscope, oh, sorry. Um, we use an amnioscope to um, visual, visualize um, through the amniotic um, uh, fluid um, to see if there's um, presence of meconium, which we don't ever do that. So. Um, if there's presence of meconium, we will find out when we break the water, okay? Um, a fetoscope, okay, so uh, we, a fetoscope is inserted um, when we do an amniocentesis, so a needle through the belly to visualize the baby for whatever reason, okay? We can collect samples um, or do surgery in this way. Um, we can do ultrasounds. We can do a vaginal ultrasound or an abdominal ultrasound. These are all the reasons why we would do that, mainly that we're trying to determine the gestational age. We're looking at the size of the baby. Oh, sorry, guys. We're almost done here, and I can answer all my phone calls. Um, anyways, we're, we're, you can do all these things with an ultrasound. Um, fetal kick counts, we do this. Um, this is one way we can tell fetal well-being. Um, sick babies don't kick. Sick babies don't move. Um, so we can have the mom like every day, like if we're concerned about this baby, we can have the mom do a fetal kick count. Well, we'd like to see 10 movements in two hours. Um, they can do that every day. If um, um, we can do that every day and if they have less than 10 movements um, in two hours, then they need to come in and we need to evaluate baby on the monitor. Um, we talked, oh shoot, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. So um, another thing we can do um, to test for fetal well-being is the Doppler ultrasound fluid blood flow studies or um, velocimetry. This is basically where we're looking at the blood flow in the umbilical arteries, the placental blood flow circulation, uh, fetal cardiac function. 
So um, this is a non-invasive Doppler study where the blood flow, it's like an echo sort of when we do on adults. It gives us a waveform um, and then they determine um, how the blood is flowing through the fetal vessels. So um, um, I'd actually never been in on one, um, but I'd love to go see one someday. Anyways, non-stress test, test, non-stress test, NST. This one you have to understand and know because we do this often on our patients. It's an evaluation of fetal well-being. It's an evaluation of fetal oxygenation. It's an evaluation of an intact central nervous system and myocardial reactivity in our baby. Okay, so we're evaluating whether these things are normal in our baby. Um, and a non-stress test will tell us that. We can start this test at about 28 to 32 weeks, depending on the maturity of the baby's central nervous system. Um, this is a non-invasive electronic fetal monitor test. Um, and we're looking uh, the possible answers from this test are a reactive non-stress test, a non-reactive non-stress test, or an unsatisfactory test. A reactive non-stress test is for a baby that is greater than 32 weeks. They have two heart rate accelerations that are 15 by 15 in a 20 minute period. Okay, so we're looking for fetal heart rate accelerations on our monitor, on our tracing, we need them to be accelerations by the definition of 15 beats above the baseline for 15 seconds, and we need those two to happen in a 20-minute period, okay? If the baby is less than 32 weeks, we need two fetal heart rate accelerations that are defined 10 by 10, 10 beats above the baseline for 10 minutes. We need two of those in a 20-minute period. That means we have a reactive non-stress test, or but what we're saying is, um, our baby is positively reactivity, reactive is a positive word. So we could say our baby is positively non-stressed. Okay. If our baby has a non-reactive non-stress test, then they don't meet the criteria above. Um, non-reactive being negative, um, and, or no non-stressed, non non-stressed being meaning baby doesn't have stress. So it's a it's a double negative. It's confusing. But non-reactive is not good. Non-reactive, non-stress test. Baby is not reactive. Baby is not good. Baby is not positive. And so they will have failed this test. Then we need to do further investigations on our baby. If it's an unsatisfactory test, that means we didn't have enough baby activity to generate accel accelerations or for some reason we weren't able to interpret it because we had a poor tracing. Um, so if if we have an unsatisfactory test or we have a non-reactive non-stress test we need to do further evaluations on the baby we will do what's called an anti uh, I'm sorry a, a, a fetal biophysical profile or a biophysical profile or a BPP a BPP, yeah, two P's, okay? So what comprises a biophysical profile? It comprises a non-stress test and a non-invasive ultrasound that are looking at four parameters of fetal well-being. It has to be completed within 20 to 30 minutes. For the non-stress test and the four physical parameters of fetal well-being, the baby will either get a score for that parameter being positive, present, or normal, or they'll get a zero for that parameter being not present, not positive, or abnormal. If the baby has a score between 8 and 10 of the 1 NST and the 4 parameters, that's 5 parameters, um, with a possible 2 points each, if the baby gets 8 to 10, then we say the baby is reassuring. If the baby gets a score of 6, which is equivocal, then we can't say the baby's good, we can't say the baby's bad. That requires further monitoring. If the baby scores 0 to 4, that's non-reassuring and baby needs to be delivered. Can baby do a vaginal delivery? I don't know. So we will need to determine what to do. Now, 
If the baby has a non-stress test and passes it, they get two points. If the baby has fetal breathing movements, a minimum of one in this 20 to 30 minute period, the baby will get two points. If the baby has fetal movements, they see three or more in this 20 to 30 minute period, baby gets two points. For the fetal tone, if there's at least one episode of an extension and flexion of um, um, a baby's joint or opening and closing of the hand, the baby gets two points. If the amniotic fluid volume is greater than five centimeters, then the baby gets two points. But if one of these are not present, they either need to be present or they are not present. So they'll either get two points or they'll get zero points. Um, okay. Um, all right, that was a biophysical profile. A, vi a vibroacoustic stimulation is, is really not a test. Um, it's this little thing that we put on the mom's belly. It's like a vibratory sound thing. Um, we put it on her belly, we push the button, we hold the button for one to two seconds. Um, it makes a vibrating buzzing sound um, that stimulates the baby uh, to move. Um, or basically we stimulated baby startle response. Um, and if the baby moves, then we can say that baby, and baby has an acceleration in their heart rate, we can say that baby is well. But if baby is sick and they move, even if they move, if they don't have an acceleration in their heart rate, then we know there's a problem, okay? Um, we can do a contraction stress test. This evaluates fetal oxygenation under the stress of contractions. Basically, this is gonna tell us, is our baby um, able to go through labor? So say we did this, oh my goodness, that's the last slide, aren't you guys excited? Say we did this biophysical profile and our baby scored, uh, say our baby scored four or five or something like that. We say, well, we probably need to deliver this baby, but is our baby able to tolerate labor? I don't know. Let's do a contraction stress test and see how our baby reacts to contractions. So we try to get three contractions in a 10 minute period that last 40 seconds, 40 seconds each. And if, um, if, if we do that and the baby does not have any late or significant variable D cells, then we have a negative contraction stress test. That means that baby negatively has, does not have stress during contractions, okay? Baby does not have stress during contractions. So we would say, yeah, maybe that baby can tolerate labor. Let's try it. If, oops, sorry, if we have a positive contraction stress test, that means then we have late decelerations or significant variable decelerations with 50% of or more of the contractions. So if the baby just has one late deceleration, um, then that's probably okay. But if the baby has, um, if the baby has four contractions in 10 minutes, and the baby has two or more late decelerations, then they've had decelerations with 50% of their contractions and they have a positive contraction stress test. That means they are positively stressed during contractions. This baby will not tolerate labor, so we need to go to a C-section. Equivocal is we have a few late decelerations. We may have a few variable decelerations, but it doesn't tell us whether the baby is gonna be good or bad during labor. I would lean to caution and say the baby will be bad during labor. Um, unsatisfactory is we couldn't get enough contractions in 10 minutes or we couldn't get illicit uh, or we couldn't get a good tracing of the baby, okay? Um, so anyways, that's a contraction stress test. And then again, we can do electronic fetal monitoring. Um, that's the end of my lecture. Um, Oh, um, what I didn't have on here, which I noticed because the next slide is the end. Um, how do we cause a contraction stress test? How do we cause someone to have contractions? Um, well, there's a couple of ways. One, we can tell the woman, oh, um, play with your nipples um, for a few minutes until you start having a contraction and then stop. <laughs> 
and then when that contraction stops, then play with your nipples again and continue that process until you have three contractions in a 10 minute period. Or we can start an IV, we can start Pitocin, and we can run the Pitocin until um, we make her contract three times in 10 minutes. Then we stop the Pitocin and analyze the baby's reaction to those contractions. The risk for doing this is you could put someone into labor whose baby will not tolerate labor. Um, and then you'd have to go to C-section. You'd have to do that anyway. So, um, all right, so this is the end of the lecture. Um, I am sorry that it was a long one, um, but please let me know if you have any questions. Remember that your exam is this weekend. Um, and thank you. I was right on time. I thought I was uh, longer, okay? All right, goodbye, guys.